I'm Scott Allen Miller, and this is my daily life living in Latin America. Today, I came outside to do the show, and my dog got so excited because she always gets crazy excited whenever I come out to do the show, and she bit my shin because she couldn't contain herself. No idea what drove her to do that, but she completely lost her mind. Today, I'm going to be answering Byron's question as to why a, so this is an, a year-old episode, why a small house in the Residencia Fatima that we looked at would be valued at $450 a month because that seems like a very high price for him considering the size of the house. I'm also going to give a little bit of a health update as I have been under the weather just a bit for the last few weeks, and I have a lot of updates on that, especially as I am hooked up to an IV most of the time, and as I'm talking just now, a bird has pooped on my arm. So I'm gonna go clean that off, and I'll be right back right after the bump. All right, let's start off with my health update. So I started about two months ago, maybe not quite that long. I was out on the beach hanging out and was in the sand and I felt like something happened to my foot. At the time, I thought it was just a bit of aggravation from sand fleas or sand itself getting into my sandals and didn't think really too much of it. But pretty quickly it turned into what seemed like kind of like a rash or something similar or really bad skin aggravation where the sand had been really abrasive with the skin. Uh, and then directly beneath that, the, the tendon in my foot got inflamed and all of my foot would randomly burn at different times. So that was clearly something wrong, but no one really had a good guess. So, you know, I just tried to take it like it wasn't the end of the world. Uh, so I kind of ignored it for a while. Fast forward to last week. We talked about this a bit on the show. I fell down last Friday, so just over a week ago, while going down a dirt driveway that was at an angle. And I apologize for the dogs. They've been doing this for an hour. I can't get away from it. Uh, I, there's a squirrel taunting them from the trees. I uh, stepped forward and my left foot just slid out on loose dirt and I lost my balance. So to keep from falling and really wrenching something, I basically just sat straight down on my right knee, which came down more or less fine, got a bruise but uh, because the driveway was at an angle, I slid down the driveway and there was a lot of rocks in the dirt and it tore my knee horribly uh, and I got dirt deep into the cut. So fast forward, I did you know, see a doctor the same day, but they were not able to clean it out enough. I got infected and so I've now, uh, for several days I was on antibiotics and everything normal and we thought it was just fine, but the antibiotics did nothing to stop the infection and I got badly infected. And by yesterday I was on the verge of passing out. I was very, very sick very quickly. I went from, oh, I'm feeling a little bit tired. My knee hurts a little bit more than I thought. So I went out and got x-rays yesterday morning. Nothing was really there and then uh, when he came over to look at it, it was really bad. I was in fever and totally fatigued, couldn't get out of bed, spent the whole day in bed, um, had chills and dry sweats and just every every symptom that came with the infection. So I was like, okay, this is really not good. Uh, so the antibiotic I was on clearly did nothing. So they got me onto an IV uh, and they started me on a seven day series of a much, 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 much stronger broad spectrum uh, antibiotic that is penicillin based. I don't know the names of anything, plus several other medicines. And I have a nurse coming over uh, twice a day to deal with my knee. So they need to like completely scratch everything away. So it's incredibly painful as they tear it all open and get rid of all the infected over and over again. So they tear it so much that I'm bleeding again every time he cleans it. So that's no fun. It's a very painful injury. But what's interesting is this was last night. So yesterday I basically slept the entire day, having slept most of the day before that as well. So Wednesday we were at the funeral, Thursday, uh, that's we were going to go to the funeral. I was so sick that we couldn't go to the funeral yesterday evening. Um, and then yesterday, I was so sick that we couldn't do anything. So basically, Thursday and Friday, I never got out of bed, more or less. And uh, uh, so I was at death's door when I went to bed last night, Friday night. Like, And I tried to do the live stream on Friday night, and we just had technical issues, so we couldn't try it. But people who did see me are like, you look bad. Uh, and it was awesome this morning on Saturday morning, we managed to do a, an over six hour live stream uh, to make up for it. So if you have not watched that, be sure to go check out the live stream uh, today um, to see what we what we talked about this morning. You do have plenty of material to watch if you're if you're interested. Okay, so um, so I went to bed in terrible shape. Uh, they give me my first injection, nothing but saline, and I nearly blacked out. My sugar crashed. It was it was awful. Uh, but now I'm feeling pretty good. I've also not eaten in several days, but I really don't need to. So that's not a problem. It's not a major fast for me, but it's just a whole bunch of things, right? I've not eaten since I think Wednesday and uh, maybe, maybe Thursday. And... Um, 
yeah, so it's been it's been an adventure. But anyway, I woke up this morning after having all that and I feel really good. So good, in fact, that I feel better than I have four months. Yes, my knee is still pretty sore because he came over and scraped it all out again this morning. It's so painful. My wife can't even look at him doing it. She's like, <laughs> it's so awful. Um, but, uh, I don't, I don't have any of the deep inside pain. Like I had my, my other foot completely healed. Like I feel great. Um, so, so things are very good. I'm, I'm feeling like I just need to wait for the surface of, of my knee to heal. But other than that, I'm, I'm really feeling good. So all's well there, but I have this for several days and I'm about to, as soon as this video is done, I'm heading out to the beach for our Desperados reopening party that is this evening. So it is a crazy busy day around here live stream all day, tons of medical treatments over and over. My nurse will be back in just a little while to do everything again, because that's what we do several times a day. Um, and for those who are wondering, uh, x-rays, because I went and got the x-ray, paid for it at the private clinic, only took 15 minutes, was $20. And having a nurse come out to the house, this is a nurse we got from the, uh, I believe from the ambulance service when they um, brought someone here. So we had his name from that. And uh, uh, he is $16 anytime you do a visit, which at $16 to have a nurse come out and deal with a bunch of stuff, great way to go just makes life a lot easier. So I'm feeling really, really good and things I've been worried about for a while, things that have kept me from getting out and doing walking and stuff for you guys, we're doing great. So feeling good about that. So let's get into Byron's question as to why this house costs as much as it does. So let's start with, I didn't go out and rent this house. So I'm kind of agreeing that I don't think it's a good value or maybe it's one I would live in if I did. Uh, so I wasn't super thrilled with the value for what you get, but a few factors need to be considered. But the most important thing is when you're looking at houses in Nicaragua, you have to remember there aren't comps. So saying, uh, oh, for the size, isn't that a bad price? Well, that's probably not something that Nicaraguans are considering all that much. That's not really where price comes in in many cases. In the United States, we have very, similar houses from block to block and neighborhood to neighborhood. And we think of things as how much they cost per square foot. Nicaraguans would never have that thought process. It's completely different. So in the U.S., we do everything based on comps. And even if one place is wildly nicer than another, its value doesn't hold up if it doesn't fit into a simple framework. Now, once you get to $100 million houses, of course, all bets are off. But when you're dealing with normal everyday houses, they have to be normal everyday houses or you get screwed in the market. So it's really encouraged the United States to get into this feedback loop of building basically cookie cutter houses everywhere and making it so that the more square footage you have, the more it's worth and the f less square footage you have, the cheaper it is. And that's all there is to it. We don't consider much of anything, but here in Nicaragua, it is everything else that we consider. So some of the factors that go in, um, not the number of bedrooms and not the n amount of square feet in general, of course, a bigger place and a smaller place, all other factors being the same, of course, the bigger ones are likely to cost more but other things are not ever all the same. Uh, location is the key to nearly everything and construction type. Those two things are massive factors. So this particular house is a relatively modern, very good construction. Uh, so that's gonna raise its price somewhat, but not a ton. More importantly is that it's location. Now I do believe that the house in question was being rented at that price furnished. I don't think that was unfurnished. It's very small, so it's not a lot of furnishings. But uh, in the video, we were talking about the appointment in the kitchen. Those things only make sense if they came with the apartment. So I believe that that is what we're talking about. Um, I don't think it had, you know, electricity or so furnished places are not, not exactly short term, right? You, you still got to bring your own internet. You got to bring your own electricity, all those kinds of things. But uh, you don't have to bring your own chairs and, and, you know, refrigerator. Those things can be a real pain for someone who is uh, looking to spend some amount of time, but not be permanent in the country. So I'm going to fall over as I itch my knee. Uh, so that is a big factor as to why it costs a lot more. Remember from some of the videos we've talked about how short-term rentals easily cost more to furnish than they do to actually have the house itself. Now, that's not always true, but especially small ones, the house is generally pretty cheap and the furnishings are quite expensive. Now, if you're just talking about a bed or a chair, that's pretty cheap. But if you're talking about a refrigerator or a microwave, those things tend to be pretty expensive and get abused pretty heavily. Now, this is a very small place. The number of appliances was very small, so it's probably not that bad and it's not including some of the expensive things like electric and internet. So that would be a factor. So I don't know exactly how it was being done. Um, and it's been over a year since I made the video. But I believe some amount of furnishing was with it. So it could be used by someone who is not looking at being a permanent Nicaraguan resident, but just looking uh, for a short term solution. The 
Uh, the bigger thing, though, is the location. It's located in the Residencia de Fatima. This is the most exclusive address uh, that is well known within Leon. And there's a few others that are like it that are also very nice and, and highly desirable. Most of them are a little bit farther outside of the city. There's very few as close to the city center as Fatima is. The Residencia de Fatima is a fully gated community with heavy security. You've got people who are walking the streets all the time checking your houses. And there's no real big, like, uh, exposure to the outside. Most of the houses are, are touching other houses, either in the resi e either in Fatima itself, outside the Residencia, uh, or against patrolled areas like uh, the the railroad uh, the railroad bed. This is a very secure area with a lot of security. And it's a very desirable area where, where people pay a very high premium to be inside that community. And of course, we're assuming in that price that they are paying the HOA fees, HOE fees, HOA fees, I can get this right, um, and that's not something that you would have to pay individually. So that could be a really big deal for a lot of people because uh, you don't have to deal with the HOA or anything like that. But that easily is only uh, $20 or so per month, but it could be a bit more, right? It's not huge, but we're talking about a total rent in this case of $450. So something that was $20 would be a noticeable amount of the total bill for sure. The getting a house that is similar in a non-gated uh, place like, say, Castle Leon would only be about two. 50 unfurnished of course so it's only a $200 premium well if you take off even $20 for the HOA fee and you add a premium of 180 just for the lo the location which is not unreasonable at all suddenly it becomes a oh okay if I'm paying for that location then this is not a problem with the the cost at all and that's where things get really different in Nicaragua the price difference per locations that can be extremely close to each other is huge that disparity is massive and Americans really aren't aren't well suited uh, to having exposure to being used to that. We're used to, well, if I'm living in this town, then the town next to it's worth almost, it can be 1% different, but things have to vary. But you're basically looking at identical prices on, on nearly identical homes, period, never going to change. Every real estate business is going to use comps between the towns. They're going to do things to make sure that they come together in pricing over time. Anything that's wildly different will sell quickly and the, the price difference will go away, right? So, uh, here in Nicaragua, not at all like that. The the every street, every part of every street, every uh, separate little neighborhood, whether it's inside a residencia or over on uh, the the open part of a reparto or whatever, all of it's going to have completely different pricing. And sometimes it's going to be uh, uh, what you expect, and sometimes it's going to be wildly different things that you just can't predict. It's all over the place. So you have to understand that. Yes, there's a certain amount of I can look at houses and 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 gain some appreciation for what costs are likely to be. But you also have to remember that there are tons of really important factors that include like the fame of the location, how close it is to things that people that may not be you want to be close to. Uh, does it have um, the right people in that community? Is it up and coming or is it already established and they don't have to worry about building new houses? Does it have really good resources? Does it have really good security or is it wide open or are they just getting started and they don't know if they'll ever build more houses. There's a lot of things that can come into play. And so um, all those factors are, are really significant and can make a difference by up to 100% the value of a house, the exact same house in two different places, even within the same city, equally distant from the city center can be 100% different in price just from those things alone. And so that is there's a really important way to look at things that now none of these are super expensive. We're talking about a full house, three bedroom, two bath for $450 in a private gated community that is absolutely beautiful with beautiful yards, and but very small, very small. He's right. It is a tiny house. I don't want that house. It's way too small. But for a lot of Nicaraguans, they don't see that as a tiny house. They see that as a practical house with three bedrooms because they don't spend time in the house and they don't want to spend a lot of time cooling the house. And so having a tiny house isn't necessarily this negative in the way that, say, an American audience might look at it. So to us, it's very easy to say that is so small. I don't want to live in a place that small. It'd be all on top of each other. And that completely makes sense. And that's a valid way to look at what you want to get. Like that's for your shopping. Be aware that those are things that matter to you, of course. But for a Nicaraguan looking at the house, it's very easy to imagine someone saying, ah, I have a room for me and my wife. I have a room for the kids or one room for each kid or, or one room for two kids or one kid and, and a room for an office or a storage room or any number of things. Um, and then, 
and then a small living room for us to hang out, a backyard for doing utility stuff and cooking. There's a little kitchen because we cook sometimes. And, and that's like it. And they don't want any more because someone would have to clean it and someone would have to maintain it and someone would have to just all those things. And if you want to turn on the air conditioning, which this place had, then the bigger it is, the more you have to run the air conditioning. And that matters real fast. So if you want to have an air conditioned place, Nicaraguans tend to want really small places, not because they want the house to be small, but because they want the space they air condition to be small. That's a big factor that Americans are not used to at all because we normally air condition the entire house. So we have to make the whole house small in order to uh, to really change the air conditioning. And we're like, but we have lots of stuff. But Nicaraguans don't tend to accumulate a lot of stuff. So the idea that you need to store tons of things is unlikely. My sister-in-law lives in Houston and has more things just in her cupboard under the stairs than most Nicaraguans that I know own in their entire houses. And I mean that. There's more in their seasonal storage cupboard than most Nicaraguans that I know own in all their clothing, all their work stuff, all their, their hobby things. Every single thing they own is typically less than that. Now, there's exceptions, but this is a very different lifestyle. The idea that your house is going to be full of things that you've purchased is not at all normal here. So size, again, of a house does not have the same ramifications that it does in other places. You're, you're very unlikely to be concerned about having a really big place because then it would just be empty. Some people like big, empty space. I love big, empty space in a house. It Well, although my house is way too big, has way too much empty space, and it drives me crazy because, again, we have to clean it. I have to walk across it every time I'm going somewhere. Literally, the house is so large, it bothers me how much I have to walk to go to the kitchen. Like, oh, I want to go grab a glass of water. Oh, it's way over there. Like, it's so much walking throughout the day. And of course, uh, there's open bits everywhere. So sometimes it rains in. So you always have to worry about if it's going to be slippery. And there's always, it's just, it's a lot. And that that's actually not this huge positive. It's not like you can sell the house on a, it's so big, it's wonderful. Actually, it's so big, it's annoying. Um, it's poorly designed in space. It has loads and loads of useless empty space that would be nice in other places, like another bathroom or two, which we desperately need and don't have. But instead, it has two massive salons that are huge, and we completely avoid them, which makes the house extra weird because we have huge rooms that are completely empty. That's not useful for anyone, but we don't want to fill them with stuff. Then we're just buying stuff to fill houses with. Why? Well, yeah, we don't want to live that way. So uh, we end up with a house that's very empty, and a lot of people would feel the same way. Uh, so that, that tiny house feel that an American will have doesn't necessarily equate similarly to a Nicaraguan. A Nicaraguan's going to likely see the value in the location, the number of rooms, the layout, the stuff the quality of the build, um, but that location is going to be primary. Just being able to say that they live in the Residencia de Fatima is a major thing, even if it's a very small house there. Uh, they may not be the ones in Fatima doing the entertaining, uh, but being able to have that address uh, certainly is something that you can brag about, and your family would be very proud. Oh, our, our kids live in the Residencia de Fatima. Oh, wow, that's really impressive. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, and it's close enough to downtown that you can live in this beautiful suburban feeling gated community, but you can still grab a cab into downtown in just a few minutes. That's important. There are other areas like San Augustine where you have beautiful houses as well and bigger ones in many cases, very similar, like general feel, really good security in the same way. But their travel time into downtown, instead of being very close and on good roads, it actually has some road problems and is relatively far away, easily double the distance away from anything you'd want to drive to. So those little things add up as, well, yeah, it's really nice houses, but if you actually have an interest in being involved downtown, it may not be nearly as, as good for you, right? You may be unhappy with how it works instead of, um, um, thrilled with how easy it is to get downtown. For example, I've never walked to San Augustine from anywhere in the city, but I have walked to Fatima many times. Uh, it's a long walk from most places, but it's not a bad walk. And and it's connected to a lot of other things. It's very close to like uh, Paseo Real for shopping mall. It's close to several different restaurants and, and the new hospital. It's got a good location in the city. So it's something to seriously take uh, a look at if you if, those are the kinds of amenities that you're interested in. And for a lot of Nicaraguans, those are going to be major amenities. For expat, they're much less likely to be. But we have regulars on the show who live either in or just in front of the Residencia de Fatima, and they love the area. It's it's actually really, really beautiful and one of the better parts of the city for a lot of reasons. And uh, and my, my foot doctor is up there as well. So it's uh, it's it's important to remember that the way that we look at houses and this this whole question that byron had is such a great example of the way that americans look at houses this everything's a comp and size and square footage and number of bedrooms 
those aren't those aren't like real factors here. Obviously, if you just had a shack and it had you know fifty thousand square feet and it was just open air, you'd be like that's worth nothing, right? There's still that. But when you're looking at real houses and and you know decent setups and you're comparing reasonable things, the things that cause the wild difference in value can be things that we're completely unaware of um, as foreigners and um, may not appreciate what makes them more expensive or not, right? Like, I don't particularly want to live in the Residencia de Fatima. There's lots of really nice things about it. I would not be super unhappy if I had to live there. But it's not my first choice of where I want to be. I like being in the barrios. I prefer that kind of lifestyle more in with society, less, you know, but, but lots of Nicaraguans, you know, they grew up here. They don't need to be more integrated. They're burned out on the loud music and they're burned out on being just in their neighbor's faces all the time. And they want a gated community where they can get away and live in some degree of opulence uh, or, or solitude, or but not be too far from the city, not be too far from where their family are from, but live in a, in a much more upscale place and feel like they're more like in an American suburb, but only inches outside of normal Nicaragua. Well, they need a place to be able to go to do that. And this particular example is a good example of where they can do that here in Nicaragua. So um, I hope that explains why in this one particular case, the house is like that, but it's also going to be why everywhere you go, you're going to have, you know, one house on the beach in Las Benitas is going to cost one thing. And the one next to it is going to cost twice as much or half as much. And you're going to be like, why, why is it so wildly different? How can it be so different? But there's so many factors, whether it's the type of lease it has, whether it's the actual amount of land or it's how it has frontage on the water or what its view is at sunset, every little thing just comes together. And it's like, okay, these really are significant differences when you live there and the people who are selling them or renting them, they're aware they chose that house for you know i have the simple beach lodge in in las Benitas, and you know we don't ever want to sell it because it has the point it has such a unique spot on the beach how do you put a number on that right when would we ever not want that to be our home i don't want it to ever not be our home right it may not be the place that we live every day but we always want it to be ours i always want that sunset to be our sunset i always want to be with that rocky point on the pacific ocean to be our rocky point on the pacific ocean that's that, that's priceless and until you know the oceans rise, rise and it's all gone um so for as long as we get but it's it's this absolutely stunning spot and and you can go to the places directly next door and say well they're almost the same they're not they're nice they're good go buy one but they're not the same only we have the point only we have that perfect sunset only we have that angle that's so good and I don't know how we got so lucky as we have it. Thank you, Melvin, for making that happen. But that's that's how unique it is. And um, every property is, especially on the beaches, is so unique. Now, when you get into places like Fatima, yeah, you're looking at cookie cutter houses across that development. So you can do comps within that little area. As long as you're inside that one gated community, you can be like, well, this one's 450. Is this one 450 that looks the same? Probably it is, right? There's going to be some, some uniformity. And in, in that really limited fashion, you can probably use comps a little bit or at least use it to be like, how does this work? That's probably okay. But in general, when you're going, you know, around the city and you're like this block, that block, this barrio to that barrio, why is it so wildly different? Sometimes it's people who are just trying to make more money and they're not being reasonable in what they're asking for. Of course, that's real. But it's also that different areas, different streets, different everything has so many factors that apply. And you may not realize this one has better airflow. This one gets the perfect sunset. This one is just closer to a really good restaurant that you want to go to every day. Or someone would want to go to every day and you don't. You probably don't want to pay extra to be facing a restaurant that someone wants to walk over and be a bar fly at and you don't want to eat at. Right? You have to consider those things. That's really important. So um, the price goes up based on what someone, what it's worth to someone who is likely to buy it, not what you are, you are value it at, right? So that's, that's an important way to look at it. But all throughout the country, just because we're so dynamic, prices will be all over the place. But I do agree, 450 is pretty expensive for how small it is. I would not jump at that opportunity. I don't feel that it's a, it's a great deal in the general scheme of deals. Um, the, the neighborhood is absolutely beautiful. It's well-maintained. It's safe. Those are great things. But um, for me, it doesn't cut it, and I don't think it does for you, but there, it's good to do these analysis and say, what makes this so expensive, and is it worth it, and is it worth it for you? Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott L. Miller.
Remember, if you're watching this on the day of, head out to Las Penitas for the Desperados reopening party. Starts at seven, 300 cord to get in the door. I'm sorry, 100 cord to get in the door, $3. And uh, uh, party all night with us. That'll be awesome. At midnight, everybody heads to Pelican Surf. And uh, I will see all of you tomorrow.